Welcome to the uh, CIS uh, Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, today we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Renu here to give a really uh, uh, exciting talk about the uh, precision medicine, point of care uh, systems for uh, you know, biomedical sensing. And uh, um, Dr. Renu has uh, three affiliations with Harvard Medical School, the uh, Children's Hospital in Boston, as well as uh, uh, Northwest, Northeastern University. So he has very long resume, so I have to just uh, read uh, most of the uh, highlights here. Um, he received his uh, bachelor's degree from uh, Madras University and then uh, did master's program uh, at Columbia University and with PhD from uh, State University of New York. And he studied with the Nobel laureate, Professor uh, Harold Urey, and which is a uh, very uh, um, a distinguished scientist, and uh, he also uh, published more than 250 publications and two monographs. He's currently working on the text level, you know, textbook level uh, 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 monograph on the uh, bio nanoscience, and he's a member of several academies. He was the uh, editor in chief for Journal of Bio Nanoscience and associate editor for Journal of uh, Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, and currently serves on six editorial boards of uh, various journals. Um, he has uh, been interacting with uh, a number of uh, leading researchers in the, in the, in the world uh, from um, uh, universities like MIT, Harvard, Stanford, uh, Berkeley, etc. So he's very well known for the uh, uh, biosensors, uh, at the interface of uh, engineering, materials, and biomedical applications. So um, without further ado, I would like to uh, invite you to join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Renault for this wonderful uh, talk. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee campus. I had been to the Madison campus many years ago. It was quite a surprise waiting for me here, but it is expanding. I have been very fortunate in knowing Professor Jen Hong Chen, with whom we share many common scientific interests. And I think our partnership in census will be a tour de force. Having said that, let me what I'm going to talk today is on personalized precision, personalized medicine, and the various tools that are emerging from nanoscience and nanotechnology, protein engineering, and uh, a number of other areas, and medical areas like nephrology, endocrinology, cardiology, urology, it goes on and on. If you look at the way we are, this country is operating, we have a healthcare industry that is escalating. And there's been a lot of discussion in the last 10 years, how to reduce the cost. If you look into the breakdown of the cost of the major illnesses, lifestyle diseases, you, you, one thing that comes to the attention, redundant repetitive diagnostic tests, and a somewhat reluctant medical community to share the information because of several complications. Doctors are not talking to themselves. It is a collaborative effort. It's not a single physician alone can solve the problem. So the repetitive redundant, redundant costs are a very large component of the total healthcare costs upwards, spiraling upwards, past a trillion dollar mark. In fact, a trillion dollar mark would be approximately one third the GDP of France. Therefore, there is an urgent need to avoid the repetitive tests and to make it more accurate. That is where the recent developments in a number of areas, material science, nanoscience, nanofabrication, protein engineering, molecular biology, biotechnology, and engineering all converge. If you do that, the tests become more accurate. Second, why is that health cost increasing? For example, glucometers have been around for a long time. Measuring cholesterol at home is not easy. 
measuring triglycerides is not easy. Now there are so many analyzes, the liver profile, cardiac profile, urology, nephrology profile. Some of them can be done by an educated patient at home. That will reduce the cost and the information will be automatically relayed either from home or from an ER, from, from an ambulance or an emergency room. And there's a lot of miscommunication between the two. And we are making these tests again and again and again. So, taking advantage of the great developments in material science, nanoscience, it's possible to make these point of care devices home based, physician office, emergency room, or in a continuous dynamic mode where you can measure from a smallest amount of blood the entire biochemical profile of a person. And from there, the diagnosis begins in a, in a collaborative, collective effort. In the case of children, this poses a neonates, this poses a problem. In the, in, the, in, the, in the animal science area, this poses a problem. Because we don't, we don't understand so much, about, although we are using animal models in biology, there's a lot of gaps in the veterinary science which came to my attention in the last four weeks, four months. And I've taken that as a major mission uh, to see that all this, you know, we know in human medicine is transplanted uh, to the animal world as we become more and more civilized towards the end of the century. Now, in the case of neonates, there are special complications. Life is just beginning. At the beginning of the life, there is, uh, the biochemical reactions that are taking place, the entire process of developmental biology is not known to us. Now, with all the advances, infant mortality is not insignificant, it's quite high. Now, our groups are working on a fusion of different disciplines of science and technologies. While we say something, say certain types of research we do may seem out of place in a medical school, yet you can see a common thread running through the entire mosaic. Now, we work on energy, photovoltaics, that's mostly and fuel cells at the Northeastern University. Sensors, picomolar sensitivity, graphene-based microfluidics. That is done in a collaborative fashion between the Boston Children's Hospital, which is a teaching affiliate at Harvard Med School, and University of California, Berkeley, Stanford Medical School, and Rice University in Houston. Also with MIT and Columbia's partners. So you can see we've got some of the elite institutions. Now the University of Wisconsin joins us. Now, we have also been known for high density memory. Everything we do is bio-based. We believe in a bio-world dominating, entirely replacing the present in organics and organic materials and making it more green and energy friendly. Now, the, the high density memory storage had been a, a project that has been kind of hush-hush due to the commercial interest involved in that. All of this, some of it started at MIT and Harvard, then went to the Florida International University in Miami. It's a collaboration between NEC, Sony, and ourselves. The idea is to create a thin film, protein-based film, which is a photochromic material that can be used for writing and reading, and densities can go upwards of 50 terabytes. The whole idea is to have a thin film embedded in a smartphone or in a tablet. That is quite exciting, but it has taken more than 15 years. Some of the initial ideas were taken from Soviet Union. Naturally, they are very upset with the whole thing, and I have not seen a single Russian-made appliance or a consumer product in any department store anywhere in the world, including Moscow. Now, we are also working on imaging, fluorescence tomography, but that project is not moving anywhere. Then we have the bio-nanorobotics, which is funded by the uh, Gates Foundation. The whole idea is to import more human-like characteristics to robots by using biosensors. Then we we'll also have a last area, smell receptor arrays. It started with the founder of the Bose Electronics. The whole idea is to create <coughs> sensors, smell sensors. How do we digitalize smell? That, that is science fiction at this moment. And <coughs> so we are supported by many laboratories, protein structure, dynamics, protein engineering, protein-based device fabrication, which is challenging. Many, many device fabrication technologies cannot be used when biomaterials come in. They're very sensitive. Carbon nanotube, which is phased out, 
graphene, which is mainly with Rice University Professor P. M. Ajayan, and now with Professor Jen Hong Chen here. And University of North Texas was also a collaborator. And the Vanderbilt Material Characterization Center for Nanoscale Systems, Solar Cell Assembly and Testing at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, all the clinical part, the medical part, is all done at the Boston Children's Hospital, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and some at NIH and UCSF. Microfluidics is in the laboratory of Professor Dorian Liepman at the University of California, Berkeley in California. There are many numerous collaborations and network of collaborations across Europe, Japan, some in China, Australia, and all in Canada too. So point of care system for ultra sensitive quantitative detection of blood analyze relevant to diabetes and coronary diseases. If you look at the chronic illness in the USA, 75% of the US healthcare dollars spent on chronic illnesses. Now, if you look at the two lifestyle, this, uh, one of them is a lifestyle, this is diabetes. Diabetes is a silent killer. We have the diabetes type one, type two, and there must be <clears throat> some way of measuring the glucose. Glucometers have been around since 1975. We can also measure the HbA1c that's fairly constant over a period of time. There's no need to measure them continuously because the dynamics of glucose is very different from the glycosylated hemoglobins. Then we have the heart disease. The deadliest disease is the cholesterol, <clears throat> high density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, and triglycerides. So we need a point of care device that in a single platform can measure glucose, cholesterol, total, break it into HDL and HDL and look at the ratio as well as the triglycerides and an HbA1c channel too. If you look at the glucose excursions in type 2 diabetes, if you look at the, the, the variation through the day, it kind of fluctuates depending on what time you take the meal, it goes up and then down and up and down. Now, a stage has come and the glucometers we are using are not sensitive. 15% or even 10% or 9% accuracy is not acceptable to the FDA because more original cases of diabetes will be treated as diabetes and you start giving the medications, whatever it is, glucophage, glucomet, and uh, genuvia or many other, and metformin as well. So, the side effects of some of these is enormous. So we got to really pin down who is really diabetic or pre-diabetic. That means we need an accurate measurement of glucose. Pancreas is the most sensitive sensor for monitoring glycemic dynamics. The pancreas detects the change in blood glucose concentration and releases the appropriate hormone by a complicated interconnected signaling pathway. So we have a project organ and a chip, pancreas and a chip. That project is still in its infancy. There are quite a few groups working on it. We work in collaboration with the um, Wies Institute at the Boston Children's Hospital and also with the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences in the main campus. There are many biosensors, sensors and biosensors. You have an analyte and a response. There's an analysis, signal detection, sample handling, and preparation. There are many ways by which there are many different techniques for biosensors. Fluorescence, DNA microarray, surface plasmon resonance, impedance spectroscopy, scanning probe microscopy, atomic force microscopy, as quartz crystal microbalance, surface enhanced Roman, electrochemical amperometry. The last one, field effect transistor, is the mode we have chosen because it's very sensitive and very accurate. Amperometric lab and a chip consists of at least four microchannels. Flow to microchambers, one consists of glucose, but the second one is for cholesterol, third for triglyceride, and the last one can be turned on, or turned on, on and off. That is for the glycohemoglobin. Now, this is a flow chart of the device. We work with the tiniest amount of blood that you can think of. There's no point in getting large amounts of blood in certain cases. In, in, in the emergency room, it's got to be the smallest, tiniest of tiny. Then it undergoes a separation into four channels, as I mentioned. One glucose, HbA1c can be turned on and off, LDL, total cholesterol, and triglycerides. The basic processes involved in using, for example, glucose oxidase, cholesterol oxidase, cholesterol esterase, 
or lipases for the detections, ultra sensitive detection, depends not only on a platform, that platform I will come to is a graphene single layer, it can, the basic processes are electrochemical in nature, redox reactions, transfer of electrons, occurs at working electrode, produces current, electrons flow to the counter electrode and the current is proposed to the concentration, a very simple thing. So there is an oxidation, the loss of electron and a reduction again of electrons, so it is a redox reaction. So the, there is a movement of electrons all across. In the case of glucose determination, we use glucose oxidase as a probe. Glucose oxidase in, undergoes a chemical reaction, releases hydrogen peroxide and the electrons flow from the glucose oxidase from the center of it called the flavin adenine dinucleotide onto the electrode, either carbon, carbon nanotubes or graphene, now graphene, we are completely abandoned carbon nanotubes and direct, tra direct transfer is a mechanism. Now, the fat, which is the electrochemical heart of this enzyme, is a cofactor, very important cofactor. Without it, glucose oxidase is not active. It's oxidized, electron acceptor, FAD cofactor involved in several important reactions, not only in glucose oxidase. It exists in two different redox states, and its biochemical role usually involves changing between these two states. The complete oxidation reduction cycle involves two protons and two electrons. Cholesterol determination, LDL and HDL concentrations are, we need two different enzymes. One is cholesterol esterase, the other one is cholesterol oxidase. Both of them contain the same cofactor, flavine adenine dinucleotide. LDL determination, we block the LDL. We use the anti-human beta lipoprotein to block it, so we are looking only at LDL and the total. Convert to cholesterol, using cholesterol esterase, oxidize the LDL cholesterol, we use cholesterol oxidase and finally it can go into an amperometric detection or into field effect FET sensing. Total cholesterol determination, extract the total cholesterol ester, convert to cholesterol, oxidize and then it goes into FET or amperometric, amperometric we are not doing anymore. Triglyceride, we use a different enzyme, that enzyme has been cloned in our laboratory we make all of our proteins, we have a protein kitchen. Glycerol 3 phosphate oxidase called GPO, it also has a fat cofactor. Conversion of triglycerides oxidize the glycerol 3 phosphate and eventually goes into FET. Now, in the case of the glycosylated hemoglobin, HbA1c, it undergoes deglycosylation to fructosyl peptide, then proteolysis, then fructosyl valine. It's actually fructosyl valine, I mean oxidase is the enzyme, releases hydrogen peroxide and the electron. Now, we were earlier using carbon nanotubes. We are decorating the carbon nanotube by covalently linking various types of proteins and lately microRNAs too. Immobilize the protein, three dimensional electrode, improved sensitivity. Immobilization is done by carboxylic, introducing carboxylic acid groups by acid oxidation, activate using EDAC, which is 1-ethyl, 3-dimethyl aminopropyl carbodiamide, stable active ester, N-hydroxysuccinamide, there is amide bond formation, nucleophilic substitution reaction. Now, all the proteins are expressed in yeast system. We are using E. coli. Problem with E. coli, highly glycosylated, phosphorylated proteins cannot be expressed. So they will not fold correctly. The folding of the protein when you express it is very important. So we switched the yeast system very successfully. Now, expression and purification proproteins transform into picia pastori strain, plate transfer transformants. There are several steps involved here. Now, the general strategy is whether you look at a solar cell, photovoltaic cell, or a biosensor to design a point of care or you look at any other you know, area or topic that you are working on, like memory project for example, photovoltaics, there is an organic, inorganic material, the synthesis, cloning by molecular biology in the case of proteins, it forms nanostructures and there is a nano interface, that nano interface is a gateway. So then there is an organic, organic interface, inorganic, organic interface, inorganic bio interface, metal oxide, organic metal oxide, bio nano interface. So, 
If somebody were to ask me why in the children's hospital we are not shining light on patients to generate electricity, but there is a common element here. Unless we understand how the electrons flow, there is no way we can design the optimal, efficient biosensor or point of care device. Now, graphene functionalization has been problematic. We use uh, a linker molecule, we work on single layer, it's all that is done in the laboratory of Professor P. M. Ajayan at the Rice University in Houston. And then we functionalize it using a linker, organic linker molecule. It's a very simple inorganic, organic compound, which we can synthesize in large amounts, and that links to the enzyme or the protein. Now, the functionalization protocol, you incubate the glucose oxidase with a 5 millimolar linker molecule. One pyrene butanoic acid succeeds in middle ester in dimethyl formamide for two hours at room temperature. Then it is washed with pure DMF and deionized water. The linker modified graphene was then incubated with 10 ml. Now, glucose oxidase is again ex was originally obtained from the fungus. We can commercially buy them, but you got to purify them extensively. Protein purification is an art. There is nothing called a 100% pure protein. You can call it 99% plus. Now, therefore, we have cloned the glucose oxidase. And uh, so we use the cloned recombinant glucose oxidase. We also have developed by protein engineering methods very large number of mutants that can interface with the single layer graphene very effectively. Then we use the Fourier transform and Roman in the signature regions, amide 1 and amide 2 in infrared, and amide 1 and amide 3, they're called boxel stretching region, which show perturbations that will indicate that the enzyme has been successfully bound, it is retained in that state. Otherwise, it is useless. FTR evidence of carboxyl functionality. Then doping leads to the discovery of new layered materials. One of the common dopings that we found very effective is the fluorine doping. There is lightly fluorinated graphene, moderately fluorinated graphene, and highly fluorinated graphene. Site-specific fluorination or doping is, is, is still a black box. So we are trying to use some enzymatic methods by which the fluorine atom can be placed in the center of the graphene or the sides of the graphene, or the edges. We were using carbon nanotubes <clears throat> up until about five, six years ago. The discovery of graphene completely overshadowed the carbon nanotube. It's a very simple discovery. Theoretically, it was possible to take a carbon nanotube, rip it apart, lay it on a table, on a flat table. You basically end up with a graphene. When I visited the laboratory of Sir Konstantin Novosilov and Andre Gaim at the University of Manchester, about approximately 10 years ago, I came back not very impressed. Much earlier to that, a postdoc of mine came to my laboratory, to my office, at about one in the night. He was a little unusual person, and he said, I did something bad. I said, what happened? I broke. Broke what? I took a carbon nanotube and made that into a flat shape. My next question, is it stable, theoretically? He came, he came back at three, he said, it's lo and behold, it's stable. And I asked him, where are we going with it? He said, I don't know. There must be some experimentalists who can create this. The meanwhile, graphene was born in different laboratories. <clears throat> it's simply not one laboratory alone. There was a lot of controversy on the war of 2010 Nobel to Andre Geim and Konstantin Novoselov. They were taken by surprise too. Scientific community was taken by surprise. Today we've gotten to a stage, there's no need to go to back to carbon nanotube. We never go back in, in science and technology. Sometimes we re revisit or quote some classical papers in physics, for example, in mathematics, or even chemistry. So the question is not what we can do with graphene. The question is what we cannot do with graphene. Therefore, we are looking beyond graphene. We are looking into silicines, organosilicine. We are looking into molybdenum sulfide, dope graphene, fluorine dope graphene, boron dope graphene, which has suddenly assumed Tremendous importance in the last two weeks. The rate at which you see news items and gra graphene is coming is astounding. Nothing like this has happened before. 
Partly because they have the internet. Any information from any place goes to another place very quickly, and people are hungry for information. Now, having said that, we were using the carbon nanotubes as a platform long time ago. No matter whether you use graphene or carbon nanotube, the first step is the immobilizing the protein. <coughs> When proteins are coupled to carbon nanotubes or graphene, there's a charge transfer. I talked about charge transfer before. From the protein to CNT or graphene, which is the fundamental principle, foundation, for the construction of any biomolecular sensing device. The nano dimensions are single wall carbon nanotubes and graphene, of course. Their electronic properties make them an ideal substrate candidate for anchoring the proteins for biochemical sensing. Integration of carbon nanotubes with proteins by covalent attachment influences the conductance of CNT. The three steps, carboxylic acid groups are introduced by acid oxidation. Activation is done by EDAC, 1-ethyl-3-3-dimethyl-aminopropyl carbodiamide, then stable active ester using n succinamide then there is an amide bond formation. Between biological macromolecules, protein for example, or an enzyme and the single layer graphene. <clears throat> All these proteins are expressed in our laboratory. Expression of glucose oxidase was being done from fungus. Uh, isolation was done. Now we, we are cloned it. They created a library of mutants. What is the objective in using protein engineering here? Number one, to be able to produce them in large amounts. Number two, to be able to site specifically mutate to make the interaction between the enzyme sur and surface, one, one side of it, and the single layer graphene. So we switch to yeast system, Picia pastoris, which is an ideal system for those proteins that are highly post-translationally modified. Now the expression and purification con consists of several steps. The project strategy is basically either CBD, I mean, the graphene is produced by CBD, a dope graphene, or it could be an organic molecule, or it could be an inorganic surface, making a nanostructure. There is a nano interface through which the electrons have to go through, it's a gateway. No matter whether you look at biosensors or point of care devices, photovoltaics, memory devices, there is an organic, organic, or inorganic, organic, or inorganic bio interface. We've got to understand this interface very clearly. Now, graphene discovery goes back to Manchester according to the Nobel. Today, there are probably about 18 or 20,000 papers that are flowing in. The rate at which we are reviewing papers, all of us, on graphene is astounding. I wonder, there is, I'm sure there's a lot of repetition, a lot of incremental things being reported. So the CVs are bloating. When you see numbers 200, 300, 500 papers, I think if you finally, it looks like a kale in the supermarket, huge. When you bring it home and boil it, it shrinks. So there's a lot of redundant re repetitive papers are coming up too. Now, graphene synthesis is straightforward. That is a, by CBD, chemical vapor deposition. I will not go into it. Transfer the graphene for a flexible electrode. Then the functionalization to create carboxyl functionality. The same thing we did with the carbon nanotubes. Now, the functionalization protocol, GOX was incubated with a 5 mm linker molecule, a simple organic molecule in dimethylformamide for two hours at room temperature and washed with pure DMF and deionized water. The linker modified graphene was then incubated with 10 milliliters of the rest of the buffers and we used the Fourier transform and infrared. You can see the infrared here. You can see a shift in the carbonyl stretching region indicating that the attached, covalently attached uh, protein or enzyme is really bound to the graphene single layer surface. We, all, we also use Roman. Roman is more conclusive. You take the Roman and infrared, basically your evidence that the functionalization has gone through and the proteins are attached, they're quite intact. You all, we've been looking at uh, graphene forms. This was in collaboration with Vanderbilt University. We are not doing it at this moment. Now, the doping leads to the discovery of new layered materials. Boron dope, fluorine dope, hydrogen dope, nitrogen dope, the several dope, we are, and European dope graphene. Fluorographene, graphene, the problem is the zero bandwidth. 
So when you create a device out of graphene, switching on and off becomes a problem. If you open the band gap by means of doping, site specific doping is still tough. You need some enzymatic methods by, take, by taking the fluorine, putting it at selective spots, that is still much is more a conjecture at this point. Now, boron doping has been looked at experimentally and theoretically. We use a density functional theory. We do a lot of things, physical, uh, physical chemistry at the same time. So if to do this all under one roof is impossible. So we collaborate with many institutions and laboratories on the campus and out of the campus and out of the country too. Much of the graphene comes from Professor Ajain's laboratory and in future it will be coming from the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee from the laboratory of Jen Hong Chen. Now, we also use the fluorine 19 and the carbon 13 magic angle spinning uh, to characterize these graphenes. And the, right now, we have done a lot of atomic force AFM studies at the highest resolution possible. We also do small angle neutron scattering as well as inelastic neutron scattering. Now cryo-electron microscopy is done in Oxford, an instrument that can go up to 2.7, 2.8 angstrom resolution. Cryo-electron microscopy is getting to the age, it's catching up. But ideally, if you can crystallize a material with very poor long range order, it's very tough. If you can do it, then we can use X-ray crystallography. So X-ray crystallography will not work. We've got to look at small angle neutron scattering, small angle X-ray scattering, cryo-electron microscopy, uh, as well as molecular dynamics, which use extensively. Now, the protein engineering at glucose oxidase, these are some snapshots at 200 nanosecond simulations. Now we've gone into microseconds. Microsecond simulation of a graphene complex and uh, of a, of a protein sitting in graphene surface requires petaflop computers. We've gone to the highest level possible here. This is a 100 nanosecond snapshot for molecular dynamic simulation and glucose oxidase interaction with graphene. What, what, what are we trying to do here? We are trying to make the interface between single layer graphene and the protein as efficient for optimal transfer of electrons. Now, there's a crosstalk between the enzyme, the probe, and the graphene surface. Electrons get quite lost, although the electrons can travel up to 30, 40 angstroms quite easily. So the current that you observe is directly proportional. That is where the FET sensor becomes very sensitive. Optimizing the electrical communication between enzymes and electrode is critical in the development of biosensors. That is, in fact, a major, major challenge. Enzymatic biofuel cell and other bioelectrocatalytic applications. One approach to address this limitation is the attachment of the redox mediators or relays to the enzyme. Here we report a simple genetic modification of a glucose oxidase. It's been published in materials today to display a free thiol group near its active site. This facilitates the site-specific attachment of a malleamide modified gold nanoparticle to the enzyme, which enables direct electrical communication between the conjugated enzyme and, say, graphene surface. Glucose oxidase, cholesterol oxidase, cholesterol esterase, uh, lipases, in the case of HbA1c, fructosyl valine, amino oxidase, and you are going to hear the ammonia sensing in plasma, which is one of the most complex projects coming up in a short while. So glucose oxide is of particular interest in biofuel cell and biosensor application, and the approach of pre-wiring enzyme conjugates in a site-specific manner will be valuable in the continued development of these systems. Now, if you look at, these are some amperometric results. They were not very satisfactory before we switched to FET. We switched to FET approximately 2012, about five years ago, four years exactly. Before that, we were using amperometric electrochemistry. Electrochemical methods are sluggish. They are not very sensitive. And you want to reduce them to a handheld device to measure glucose, cholesterol, triglyceride, HbA1c, and several others. Uh, you need to have only a FET type of sensors. This is a cyclic ultramograms for cholesterol bioprobe with different cholesterol concentrations. It is sensitive, but not as sensitive as we would like it to be. 
This is a graphene-based sensor response to glucose concentration, the resistance on this axis, and the glucose concentration on the x-axis. As a function of glucose, for a single sensor is shown for three sequential experimental measurements. Now, if we reduce all the data that we obtain on the glucose FET sensors, cholesterol, triglyceride, HbO, HbA1c, and now with the liver enzymes, with the nephrology, uh, for example, uh, kidney injury molecule, creatinine, blood urea nitrogen, there's a whole variety of things. In fact, the other day somebody was telling me we can have a couple of blocks of people. They can line them up in a queue. Neurologists, obstetrician, gynecologists, nephrologists, urologists, cardiologists, it goes into several areas. All of them are interested in very sensitive point of care devices. Now, microfluidics has been around for a long time. The flow of a viscous fluid like blood requires understanding and manipulating the microfluidics to ensure the efficient functioning of the designed biosensor. It provides an understanding of the behavior, precise control and manipulation of fluids that are geometrically constrained to a small, typically sub-millimeter scale. Microfluidics goes back to 1950s. What is happening now, I hope this trend becomes solid. The discovery of something in the laboratory, a, labor, a prototype sitting in the laboratory, going into some kind of a pre-commercial prototype, and then various phases of it before it ends up in the, in the market, is a long chain. It's kind of getting reduced now. That trend is good. If you looked at the history of science, everything that was discovered at the turn of the last century, some of them took a long, long time. There was no communication at the time between scientists. The left image shows a microfluidic test bed made from polycarbonate using hot embosome. The fluid channels are 100 micrometers wide, 75 micrometers deep. In the middle of the device is a graphene FET sensor with gold contacts that are accessed through the holes in the plastic cover. The right image shows a magnetic sensor chip with microfabricated electrodes integrated into the polycarbonate. All this is done at the University of California, Berkeley, in the laboratory of Professor Dorian Lippmann. Now, initial experiments with the device, large range of glucose concentration is got to work in low glucose, mid-level glucose, and high glucose. High sensitivity at low concentration. Work repeatedly with somewhat reduced amplitude. This is the figure at the bottom. Shows a microfluidic channel in the, the plastic polycarbonate shielding gold pads opening for electrical connection, sample volume in a microfluidic channel is approximately two microliters. The device fabrication, I am not an expert in microfluidics. All of them is done in Berkeley in the laboratory of Professor Dorian Lippen, as I said earlier. This is thermoplastic devices, polycarbonate or acrylic. Hot embossed devices, there are several steps involved in this. In the sensor fabrication, a gasket is created in a plastic sheet via hot embossing. A functionalized graphene sensor is placed inside the gasket. Using a mask, two gold pads are spotted for electrical connection. Now, the IJN ships the entire device with the gold contacts to us. Then we make sure they are all right. And functionalization is done in Boston. Microfluidics up there. And uh, MIT comes in, in a variety of spectroscopic techniques like surface enhanced Norman. There's a group in Columbia we collaborate with also. Microfluidic channels are printed on a double-sided tape and placed on top of the graphene sensor. The device is covered with a plastic sheet, leaving openings for the electrical connection on the inlet and outlet of the microfluidic channel. This is a schematic of the biosensor chip. There is the inlet for the blood here, the plasma separation. There's also a pump, a micro pump. And there are several channels that is present. We'll see that in a little better. The prototype microscale device that we have created, single platform. Again, I repeat, it's a multiplex sensor. One of the very few multiplex sensors that may become available in the market. So you don't have to be running around with different uh, point of care devices. One for cholesterol, one for glucose, you know, that will add to the cost. And the cost of this device is relatively it's affordable. If the glucometer runs in about $18, $20, somewhat subsidized with glucose and blue shield, this may come to maybe another $10 more. 
provided the patient is educated and he doesn't scared looking at the values. There's another problem here, fear complex, for example. In microRNA detection, let us say a patient wants to test his blood sample from microRNA, right, for any type of carcinoma, and he sees a value that is abnormal. What should he say? He, he gets scared. So we want to avoid that shock. And so some of these devices may still may have to be used in a physician's office or a hospital or an emergency room or an ambulance uh, by trained paramedics, but others can be done at home. Now, since there's a several field effect transistors, the channel of each a pre-functionalized graphene and will be operated in backgated mode. Each covalently anchored protein and graphene would be sensitive only to a particular targeted species. Here is a very important point. Emerging two-dimensional nanomaterials alone cannot, are not expected to show any specificity. Specificity is something that is germane to the world of biology. A single enzyme can detect only one probe at a time, sometimes multiple probes. So the st specificity, you want to call it stereospecificity, how this emerging two-dimensional nanomaterials comes only when you bring in the world of biology and life sciences into two-dimensional nanomaterials. Now, one of the most complex projects we have is the high-sensitive multifunctional biosensor for microRNA quantitation. This entire project, except for some parts of it in Children's Hospital, MIT, Berkeley, is located at the Stanford Medical School in the Department of Radiology. I'm the PI of this project is a person with a long name, not as long as mine. Gene expression regulation by microRNAs in cell mechanism. MicroRNAs interact with the three prime UTR of messenger RNAs. Low microRNA, mRNA base specificity can block translation. Each microRNA can potentially interact with several hundreds of mRNAs. Block gene expression by mRNA degradation of translation. The role of microRNA and as a biomarker, we are all after biomarkers, has been emerging in the last five years. The whole thing started with a crisis in the year 2013, 2012, when a patient had a rare type of cancer, bile duct cancer, called cholangiocarcinoma. There is, then, I, then the oncologist in Dana, in Dana Farber, Mayo Clinic also suggested let us measure the microRNA. See, we, we can't be making experiments with a patient who is sick. Finally, he died. At that point, th there were only two or three laboratories Mayo Clinic, University of Tokyo, Dana Ford. No one else can measure, quantitate the microRNA. Now, recently, when we lost a feline species at home, presumably due to carcinomatosis. There is, we try to measure the microRNA. Even uh, the veterinarians will not agree that microRNA is a biomarker for a feline species. But we did send the samples to the University of Tokyo, Mayo Clinic, Stanford, as well as Dana Ford. All of them confirmed the absence of microRNA. Later, unfortunately, after the passing of the feline, we found by an autopsy, there was carcinomatosis, which caused peritoneal fluid to accumulate, and his stomach was bulging. Some of the veterinarians were so comical. They thought giving him a four-course dinner and making him eat, because he's been starving for a week, was an absolutely preposterous. Every crisis, every challenge is utilized, whether human or non-human, towards some new scientific discovery. And this goes on endlessly, all the 24 hours. So the point here is the microRNAs are in biomarkers. Before the, I don't know who the, the present Surgeon General of the United States is, who is in Washington at this moment, I have no idea at all. The previous one was a student in my laboratory. So he was proposing, let us have a screening at the neonatal stage for microRNAs. 
can we determine this is also catastrophic? If a child, for example, can be abused, is diagnosed as a proclivity towards carcinoma in the later life, what do we do? It can be abused. See, medical abuses are, are quite dangerous, and they are going to be there for a long time to come. So the idea is to have a microRNA screening early enough in life. What do you do with it? That's another question. That's where the, the cancer therapeutics comes in. Role of microRNAs has been very well established in breast cancer, certain types of cancer, and they're all 22 mer polynucleotides. So we make a sense and an antisense, and they're conjugated, hybridized on the surface of the graphene surface. It's a very complicated process. The multifunctional PLGA, nanoparticles for antisense microRNA, targeting peptide. There are several steps involved in this. Strategy is currently used for microRNA quantitation, quantitative RT-PCR to assess the copy numbers from pre microRNAs. <coughs> Tacman <coughs> probes to quantitatively measure mature microRNAs, molecular beacons. DNA RNA hybrids, next generation sequencing, micro arrays. The scheme of graphene based sensing for micro RNA consists of a synthetic polynucleotide, 22 residue long sense and anti sense that are hybridized. We look at the fluorescence property. For example, graphene concentration dependent quenching of the 16 5 anti sense micro RNA. As you increase the concentration, there is a clear quenching. So we use the fluorescence here. Fluorescence is a very sensitive technique. We also use impedance spectroscopy, surface enhanced Roman. Now, to get the microRNA to a POC, a point of care device, is very complex. There are many microRNAs. They're in a sea of microRNAs. I'm not sure how we are going to solve the problem, but role of microRNA in carcinoma is getting firmer and firmer and firmer day by day. In certain types of cancer, like breast cancer, lymphoma, I think it's pretty well established. We still have the pancreatic cancer, the liver hepatocarcinoma. It's very tough. We are working with the transplant surgeons to get biopsy samples from outside the country uh, to be able to extract the microRNA and look at them. So here comes the transplant surgeons. If you're complaining about one branch that was left out, See this multi-channel. The schematic illustration of proposed microfluidic sensor functionalized with multiple microRNAs. Targets for evaluating a panel of microRNAs from blood samples. Now comes the most challenging project ever taken up. Ammonia gas sensors have been there for a long time. They're quite sensitive. They can go up to parts per billion. But to be able to sense ammonia, NH4+, plus, not NH3, in plasma of neonates at the bedside in a static mode and a continuous mode, we use a, a, a family of proteins called ammonia transport protein, AMT base. Ammonia transporter from AMT or ORH family is structurally and biochemically well characterized, and our lab has extensive experience in purifying and handling these proteins. X-ray crystallography and ammonia transport protein has been done, fortunately. In order to visualize the conformational rearrangements, there's a channel there. So this is a channel protein that is embedded in a liposome. NH4 goes, plus 4 goes in. Finally, there's a release of electron and onto the graphene surface. But the problem of getting a protein, a proteoliposome to bind graphene is not easy. That's where we are still experimenting with it. Now, in order to test the AMTB activity, we reconstitute the protein into liposomes, and the activity is, is, is measured using surface-supported membrane electrophysiology. So there is a, a channel protein. This protein is so big, there are 11 transmembrane channels in it. This is an early molecular dynamic simulation of the ammonia transport protein inside the lipid bilayer. This is average at 10 dummy atom models of the ammonia transport protein from cryo-electron microscopy, not from our laboratory, from our collaborators at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow in, in partnership with Oxford University. 
and Grenoble, in fact. So it's a multinational effort that is required here. The future perspectives, we are trying to use a mediated transfer. A mediator is usually a ferrocenium to ferrocene. Nanoplasmonics for the detection of glucose. Now, the challenge comes in continuous glucose monitoring. Why do we need that? We all saw the, the variation of the glucose from at the time of the day. Therefore, you need to have a bedside glucose, continuous glucose monitoring. I think this is still a far cry. I was talking to some of the drug companies the other day, and none of them are sure that they can come up with a continuous monitoring. We need one for cholesterol, so it's a lot of work here. But when we do research, we are concerned about something very important here. Simply, we don't want to make a device. We want to understand the science behind it. Would that science open up new avenues? For example, a merger between material science and enzyme catalysis, as I mentioned, for site-specific doping, the fluorination by enzymatic processes. These are some areas which will be bringing new science. The science as it is developing now, we are more going into application side, but while forgetting fundamental seminal advances in chemistry and physics is what triggers the whole. That is what I would like to see any project. This lab and a chip has been around for a long time, but a multiplex sensor is a technological engineering challenge. There are emerging platforms, boron, boron nanotubes, molybdenum single layer is very promising. Our team, I should have my name at the very end, Dorian Leapman at the University of California, Berkeley, P.M. Ajayan, <coughs> PhD, Rice University, Houston, Texas, another long name from Stanford Medical School, Gerard T. Berry, MD, is, a, is, a, is an expert in, in pediatric diseases, he's a pediatrician. Michael Agus is a medical intensive care unit. Joseph Bonaventry, Renal Division, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, Urology, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, Arnold Jewell at the University of Strathclyde, Slavo Filipek at the University of Warsaw, and Dr. Sonia Vishwanathan at the Newton Velocity Hospital. She's an internist. Those three people inspiring us are not humans at the bottom of the list. So this is an overview of the Harvard Medical School, the Quadrangle. Of course, this place had been very historic. Children's Hospital itself had two or three Nobel laureates, three Nobel laureates. The, the way you count in Harvard is a bit funny because people are everywhere. So every hospital tries to put their name. So totally it has generated maybe a couple of dozen Nobel Prizes in physiology and medicine, one way or another. And quite a few of them still are around. You can see them in the cafeteria, sometimes colliding with them. But I don't think there are any, anything sacrosanct about them. They're just like us. This is General's Hospital in Boston. This is my lab. It's on the 14th floor. My labs are strewn everywhere. Harvard Yard. This gentleman was a great inspiration. And uh, as I said, it's a partnership not only between humans as well as non-humans. Right now, as I told you, we're extending this to an uh, important problem, renal collapse. Right now, creatinine and blood urea nitrogen are two biomarkers. We have a kidney, kidney injury molecule, KIM-1 and KIM-2. that came out of the Brigham and Women's Hospital. So we, there's been crystallized. Uh, look, we are doing a lot of structural biology too. At one time, I was only doing structural biology, but nobody buys it now. Unless it is tied to a, to a disease or to a device, or something that the consumer best buy meat. Otherwise, we don't get any money. Even with all that, we don't get money. Scientists and money are two poles apart. Uh, they have not been good entrepreneurs. Only a fraction of the intellectual property generated right in this building probably finds its way to the marketplace. It's unfortunate. So, working in all kinds of directions, and uh, I want to thank all of you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Manu, for the uh, wonderful talk. We have time for questions. So, uh, any questions for Dr. Manu? I was actually, you know, I have a question. I, that's, uh, and I know we have uh, many students here, so 
what they would like to know probably is, you know, what are the, uh, the most opportunities for the uh, biosensor research, you know, particularly relevant for engineering and uh, real applications, which we are focusing on PLF, EWM. So maybe you could, you know, give some advice to them you know, um, along the line. Sensors are there to stay with us, no matter where you look. All kinds of sensors, sensors have been around for a long time. Biosensors, that is the intensively pursued in your laboratory, for example, here, and Bios and several others, uh, have become very important in medical diagnostics, right? You may also find applications in security, for example, in homeland security, right? Then a hidden explosive or some thing is in the suitcase, you got to go to parts per billion. Some of them may emanate or nit nitrogen oxides may come out of it, ammonia may come out of it, or it might be some, some other substances of abuse. So it has applications in those areas as well. And these are getting so small that we don't know that we may not be even aware that uh, a sensor is around us. Therefore, in terms of job opportunities, first of all, training in this area. As I said, we got to create a new workforce. That workforce will be very different from the workforce we need, we, the training for at one time, maybe 10, 20 years ago. You talk of biosensors, you need a strong background, not only in biology, but in biochemistry as well, right? And the ability to express these proteins is a biotechnology concept. So the type of courses that a student should take to prepare himself for the future job market is quite complex. I'm not sure we got the faculty in all the universities to be able to teach this. We may have to create a new generation of faculties who will not have any mindset, so the open mind, like all of you, the younger generation here. So job opportunities are growing. If you look at the number of medical companies that are working in diagnostics, take Minnesota, now we've got the Medtronics, <clears throat> got the Boston Scientific in Maple Grove. You got several companies, you know, Beck, Beckton Dickinson. Then you got the Thermo Fisher, right? There are several companies that are coming up. Worldwide market for this is increasing. I've seen some of these figures, you know, being put out when you ever start a company like you. Uh, the statistics. I wonder they're true. They're probably true. <clears throat> and uh, also there are other companies competing with us. This is a uh, politically contentious issue right now. Uh, companies in China, in India, in Taiwan, and just about everywhere. And therefore, job opportunities should be opening up. I am also intrigued how much of this workforce will remain here. So, you know, the uh, eastward migration may occur too. That's already happening in areas like information technology and software and so on and so forth. Therefore, I think the, the, the future is very bright. The question how we train them. And also the background of the students is concerned. The four-year colleges are not doing a good job. Students end up in the four-year college from a school that is lackluster, has not paid any attention to training. So all these things worry me. So there must be a very robust teaching programs jointly, for example, with the Medical College of Wisconsin, should join hands. Madison campus you are, uh, has been well established. I know when you have, whenever you have a huge, towering institution like Harvard and MIT, Boston University and others feel a little not so happy and they try to compete. I don't think competition is necessary, collaboration is the way to do it, even among nations. Any other questions? When you start talking about the material modification, uh, uh, you mentioned to functionalize the big protein or <coughs> enzymes on the carbon nanotube or the surface. <coughs> but um, well, there are also reports saying it's easy to peer all those you know, big functional groups. Do you have any suggestions on stabilizing the bonding be uh, between the protein and the uh, <coughs> carbon surface? There are two ways of looking at it. Native enzymes, be what we call as wild type, right. can do the function. But <coughs> certain residues in, say for example, an ammonia transfer protein might be binding to the graphene. 
So if you mutate those residues, it might be an electros electrostatics. You can, maybe it's charge group there, lysine or genine, <coughs> glutamic acid. You can modify them so that you can make the attachment much stronger. That is where protein engineering comes. In. But I have not seen as we we are not we have done a lot of glucose oxidase mutation. Ammonia transport protein is a beast. If anything can happen to mess up a protein in nature, ammonia transport protein would be the most notorious member of that. So that is hard. So you can genet genetically modify them using biotechnology. That's what I was saying. I don't think it's any rule of thumb. Question related to the glucose sensor. So we know for the home testing now, the glucose test strip costs about one dollar or less a piece. So I consider that as pretty affordable. So um, what do you think of the future directions of the glucose uh, detection at home? Are you trying to make it cheaper, or are you trying to make it <coughs> more uh, um, robust? Cheaper. You see, people? there was a time when we were working on the memory project. A question was asked, supposing we need one ton for making, let us say, mem protein based memory devices, thin film, to be put into the tablets and smartphones. At that time, the price was about $600, $700 per gram. Today, thanks to China, the price has come to something like $10 or $20 or $30 per gram. So the cost of the one component of the material is coming down. Now the question of graphene mass production is being addressed. Again, there are Chinese companies that seems to be ahead of just about everyone in the world. So the material cost is less. Fabrication cost, right? And testing and other things will be there. So what will be the cost of a glucometer using the new technology, using graphene microfluidics, we have not made any accurate calculation. I don't think it's going to be bad. But cost again is dependent on the demand. So either cost is comparable or even two times the cost of present glucometers. As the volume of the sales increase, it is going to come down. Right? And the lifetime is another question. No, there's a time when people are saying, I'll only buy devices that will last a lifetime. I don't think it makes sense. People want to throw away, this throw away culture. I think that uh, this country has been, has been singularly blamed. <clears throat> it will continue for some time. How many of us go back to an old device and take it to a repair? Who will repair it? For what? Okay. Cell phone breaks, it breaks. What do we do with the components inside it or the green? Are they benign? That's another question that we have to begin to work. The cost will come down eventually. It's comparable. It's not too far. Maybe too far. Yeah, what about the continuous monitoring for type 1 uh, diabetes patients? Is that how critical? No, the question is now, how many different analytes in the blood you want to measure continuously? Glucose is one. Now what happens? In the continuous monitoring, wirelessly the information is sent to a central desk in a critical care unit. There the human element still comes in. Right? She has to pass it on to the physician, right, wherever he is. And if you are going to, for example, I tell you, this outsourcing business in healthcare will not work. Number one, sensitive information is going out. By the time I get a number to ring in India and pick up, someone to pick up, I'll be going to a lunatic asylum. Nobody picks up the phone, send me a text message, what's that? Some things don't work like that. So there is a human element in war. So how many analyzes we want to measure continuously? Glucose maybe, ammonia in plasma, right? And if you are talking of a really very low scale multiplex system that can measure everything, all you need is let us say five microliters of blood. <clears throat> that information, integration of all that information, requires a physician's intervention. That's where I think we believe, the medical community believes, artificial intelligence will play an important role. 
You will take a large amount of data, collate and say these are the problem, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Even before the patient arrives in the emergency room. So it has got to happen with such great speeds. Right? We have to throw, go back to artificial intelligence will become very common, will be affordable. Algorithms are getting all the time better. So there's a number of interesting challenges and questions. What will be the healthcare like in 2050? 2100, 2200? We still don't know. We can make some, some educated guess of what will happen, right? Or and at the same time, the human lifespan is going up too. Not noticed by many. People are living longer, posing a major problem for the Social Security Administration, Medicare, Medicaid, and whatever that plan that we had being revamped into whatever that it may be revamped. We don't know. A lot to do. Collaborating. That's the key. Yeah. Not one single person can do it. Very good. Let's thank Dr. Renault again. Thank you. Thank you.